He has no rival. He has no equal. He's the only one that died, was buried, and is risen again. He's alive. He is alive. We worship you today, Jesus. King of kings and Lord of glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Well, you may be seated if you can. <clears throat> and I just used about all I had left of my throat right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Ushers come with an outline for anyone who missed one on the way in. If you need an outline, raise your hand and they will get one to you straight away. James Ridley, happy birthday, man. God bless you. An Easter birthday celebration. Would you congratulate him? Wish him happy birthday. Special greetings to our brothers and sisters worshiping in Winthrop. And uh, we just have been so privileged to have that satellite campus now for about two years, I think it is, a year and a half, something like that. We send you our greetings. So grateful to be worshiping with you today. And then... There's another campus we want to greet today. Would you say hello to the Danvers campus this morning? Look at that parking lot. I'm told they are packed to capacity, nowhere to put the cars in Danvers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory. To God. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, everyone in Danvers. We love you. We're so excited for you. We're so proud of you and uh, just so grateful to see all that God is doing and your willingness to go and to give up these seats here. And as you can see, we've already filled them. And so um, we just uh, will continue to keep on keeping on for Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for your prayers, your many, many, many text messages, 65, 75 text messages last week uh, telling me you're praying for me while I was out sick, but didn't Pastor Clark do an amazing job? <laughs> Most of the text messages I received went something like this, Mike. <laughs> Pastor Tim, hope you're feeling better. I wouldn't get sick again for a while. Pastor Clark knocked it out of the park. <laughs> and then the obligatory line, which everyone feels compelled to say, but you're still the best. <laughs> which is really probably not true, but I thank you for saying it anyway. Listen, no senior pastor, no father-in-law could be prouder. Amen. Thank God for the great, great preaching team we have here. <laughs> Speaking of being proud, look who else is here with us on Easter Sunday. Come to Grampy, come to Grampy, come to Grampy and say hello to this great, big, wonderful Easter crowd today. Look at all those beautiful people. She says, and so it begins. Would you like to sing for everyone today? Huh? There's your mommy right over there. Where's my mother? Where's my mother? This, for those of you who do not know, uh, who this most beautiful, precious child in the world is. This is Savona Sky Clairvoy. And she is my first grandchild, the daughter of Pastor Clark and Kimberly. Look, look, she's going for that beard. She likes, that's another vote for the beard. Sorry, you folks who don't like the beard. She likes the beard. Thank you, sweetheart, for dropping in to say hi. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Oh, look at that. She wants to stay with Grampy. She wants to stay with Grampy. It's the first I've been able to see her. I actually haven't seen her until, until just then because I've been uh, so sick. But uh, thank you again for your prayers. If you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? I'll try to contain myself this morning, but it is Easter. <laughs> Pastor Bobby already read the text. Let me read it to you again. When Sabbath was over, Mark 16, verse 1, we're mostly in the NIV today. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Jesus, of course, has just died on the cross. He's been buried 
uh, in a borrowed tomb. Verse two, very early on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. Uh, people ask, why do we worship on Sunday? We worship on Sunday because that's the day Jesus resurrected from the dead. Sunday's not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday. It's the seventh day. That was the practice throughout the Old Testament and still is the practice today for, for Orthodox Jews and others. But we celebrate or we worship, we gather to worship on the first day of the week because that's the day Jesus resurrected from the dead. So very early, verse two, very early on the first day of the week, Jesus, just after sunrise, they went on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They had one thing is on their mind. They have one concern, one worry, if you will, who's going to roll that big stone out of the way? Who's going to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves? Verse four, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. This, of course, would be an angel. Verse six, don't be alarmed, he said. <clears throat> You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Jesus always keeps his word. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for these moments around your word today. Lord, we worry about so many things. Stones, as it were, objects, uh, obstacles in our lives that we wonder how are they going to ever get rolled out of the way? How will they ever be moved? But Jesus, your resurrection power is strong enough not only to remove tombstones, but to remove every other stone, obstacle, challenge, difficulty, problem, everything that would dare to cause us to worry. Jesus, you have the power to remove it all if we will but put our trust in you. Come now, Lord Jesus, open up our hearts and ears to receive, to hear what you would want to speak to our hearts and lives this day. Hide your servant behind the cross. May Jesus Christ be high and lifted up, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. And amen, you may be seated. Speaking to you today on the subject, on this Easter Sunday of 2019, the subject, the day that worry died. And I'm so excited to have my pulpit back too. I'm glad to have my big pulpit that covers a multitude of sins here. But uh, <laughs> the day, the day that worry died. And I'm using that title because as we discovered from reading our text, the women going to Jesus' grave, they were worrying about something. They were worrying about a problem. They were worrying about a challenge, a difficulty that had already been solved. You ever worry about something and find out you didn't really have to worry about it at all? Come on now, be honest here today. Any worry warts in the house today? Any worry? All right, all right. 43 of you, the rest of you. If we're honest, we'll all have to admit that there's certain things we worry about, even when we know we shouldn't. Yeah. Maybe you've never thought about it this way before, but Easter Sunday, the day that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, is really the day that worrying should have ended for all of us. For not only did Jesus roll away a stone that was designed to keep him in a grave, his resurrection confirms that he has power to roll away any stone, any obstacle, any problem in your life, Jesus is more than capable of rolling it away for you today. So you have no reason to worry any longer. Yeah. There's a lot of things we tend to worry about. Let me see if I can put them into about three or four categories for us today. Number one, we do not need to worry because of the resurrection, because of Easter, we do not need to worry about death any longer. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, let's just go after the big one right, right, out, of the, right out of the bat, huh? or right out of the cage, or right out of the right out of the box. Is that what I want to say? Right out of the box. I couldn't figure out what am I trying to get out of here? I'm trying to get out of the, right out of the, right out of the gate. Thank you. Right out of the gate. Anybody else? Uh, right out of the gate. Let's go after the big one. A lot of people worry about death. The Bible teaches us a few things about death. First, it teaches us that death came onto the scene through Adam's sin. We read about it in Romans chapter five. And boy, don't we want to talk to Adam and Eve when we get to heaven? 
I mean, you know. Here's what we read about Adam in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, death has come to us because of sin. And in this way, death came to all men, listen, because all sinned. What's the Bible saying? It's saying that the first man, Adam, sinned and that every man since Adam, every man, every woman, has sinned and that with that sin has come the penalty of death. And it's not just physical death, but the Bible teaches us that it's spiritual death as well. A death that separates us from God. And from the time of Adam, mankind has known death because every one of us has sinned. Romans 3.10 tells us that. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. A little later in that same chapter, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so it is that you and I and every person to ever walk the face of this earth, we have feared death, we have fought death, not only because we're afraid of physical death, but because for so many there's a fear of an eternal death, an eternal separation from God as judgment for their sins. So something had to be done about this sin problem for man. And someone had to pay the price for our sins. Someone who was without sin. Someone who could break the power of sin and the bondage of death for us. We read about this someone in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. Here's what we read. But we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. In other words, he left heaven and came to earth as a man. Now crowned after his resurrection. Now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, loved ones, friends, neighbor, whoever you are here today, and if this is the first time you've ever been in church, please understand that everything we enjoy today, we enjoy because of the grace of God. That's yes. what we read there. He tasted death for all, so that by the grace of God, that's unmerited favor, it means because of his love and his mercy, his grace, by the grace of God, he, that is Jesus, might taste death for everyone. Yes. We read a little further in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Why? Again, what's the Easter story about? Why did Jesus do this? It tells us right here. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus has broken the power of death so that we no longer have to worry about that. In fact, Jesus speaks to us from Revelation chapter one, verse 18, where he says, I am the living one. I was dead, not I am dead. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. Satan no longer has any right to the keys of hell and death. They have been transferred into the hands of the living Savior who has overcome death, hell, and the grave. So that we who are in Christ no longer need to fear, we no longer need to worry about death. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 19. Here's what he says. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed, verse 20, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Look at verse 22, for as in Adam all died. In other words, we inherited that sinful nature. We inherited that proclivity to sin. For as in Adam all sin, watch the rest of this verse, so in Christ all will be made alive. If you are in Christ, if you are in a relationship by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, you are made alive in that relationship as you put your faith and trust in him. We can join with the Apostle Paul who said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We don't need to fear death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The stone of death has been rolled away forever, for he is risen just like he said. Muslim lady was talking to a missionary and 
after her 16 year old daughter had died. She said, what did you do to my child? He said, man, we didn't do anything to her. She said, oh yes, you did. Because she died smiling. Our people don't die that way. Our people don't die that way. What she didn't know is that that missionary had led that 16 year old girl to Jesus Christ before she had died. This is the great difference between Christianity and so many other religions. Our story does not end with a corpse, but continues with a conqueror. As C.S. Lewis, the great British academic and writer said, Easter is death working backwards. What a great quote. Easter is death working backwards. Jesus has reversed the curse of sin and death. Therefore, because of Easter, we do not have to worry about death any longer if, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ who's conquered death. Something else we don't need to worry about because of Easter. We no longer need to worry about the devil. Now, if you don't believe in a real devil, you can just kind of check out for a few moments. And when I get to point three, I'll bring you back. All right. But the devil is real. But not only has Christ rolled away the stone of death, another obstacle that was defeated, destroyed and rolled aside on Easter morning was the devil himself. We just read in Hebrews two a moment ago that Jesus not only broke the power of death through his death and resurrection, but he actually broke the very power of Satan himself to hold people in slavery to sin and fear. Oh, the devil's such a tormentor. Pastor Clark talked about this a little bit last Sunday. What an obstacle he can be to those who are without Christ. But for those in a relationship with Christ, there is no need to worry any longer about the devil. In fact, Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus Christ, having disarmed the powers and authorities, referring to the powers and authorities of Satan, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. But understand something else this morning. Christ not only destroyed the power of Satan and his demons on the cross of Calvary, that's the very reason he came. 1 John 3, 8 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy, to undo, to do away with the devil's work. What's the devil's work? Jesus told us that in John chapter 10, verse 10, didn't he? He said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the threefold plan and strategy of the devil for your life. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. The only way you can have it to the full is because it's resurrection life. That's the kind of life we know and enjoy today. You see, even though the devil's been defeated, he's still putting up a good fight. Although he's been overthrown, he's not yet been eliminated. Instead of this bringing his activities to an end, the rage he feels in the knowledge of his approaching doom only leads him to redouble his efforts to take as many to hell with him as he can. It's kind of like a military battle where it's clear that one side is going to be defeated, but rather than concede, they go out in a blaze of fire. They try to create as much pain and chaos as they can until the battle is finally done. And so it is that victory over Satan has been won, but painful conflict with him continues. There may be, again, some here today who you're just not real sure there's a real devil, but 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, be alert. Doesn't say be worried. Does say be alert. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But if your life is surrendered to Jesus Christ, you have no reason to fear or worry. You can stand upon his resurrection power and proclaim with the apostle John, greater is he that is now in me than he that is in the world. James 4, 7 gives us further instruction where we read these words, submit yourselves then to God, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll be the one doing the flee. He will flee from you. People say, oh, Pastor Tim, pray for me. Devil's been chasing me down. And blah, 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 blah. What are you doing running from the devil? Right. Come on. Yeah. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Stand fast in the faith. And he will flee from you. But maybe you're here today and you've, you've neither fully submitted yourself to God nor fully resisted the devil. If that's the case, it's very likely that you're here today struggling with the oppression that Satan so often uses to defeat people 
who at least in some part of their heart, they really want to they want to have a relationship with God. They want to serve Christ, but they have a hard time doing so. I would remind you of Peter's sermon in Acts 10, 38, where he speaks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. God is right here with us today, friends. And that same power of the Holy Spirit is available to heal and to save and to set free those being harshly treated by the enemy. He has all kinds of tools, but whatever tools, whatever he's using to oppress you, understand one thing this morning, Satan is a liar. And when he tells you there's no hope, he is lying. When he tells you there's no way out, he is lying. In fact, the Bible tells us that he specializes in lying and that's why he's called in John 8, the father of liars. Consequently, he will not tell you that there is deliverance available today. He will not tell you that there's healing and salvation available today. He will not tell you that whatever you need today, it is available by grace through faith in Jesus Christ who has conquered Satan and rolled him aside like a tombstone. He need not be an obstacle for you any longer. There's a third thing we do not have to worry about because of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do not have to worry about the dominion of sin in our lives anymore. Now, those of you who didn't believe in the devil, come on back because you'll identify with this third point. We do not have to worry about the dominion of sin. Now, this is, the, this is the one point that really we have a hard time with, even professing believers. We buy into the fact that Jesus has defeated death. We buy into the fact that Jesus has defeated the devil. But when it comes to accepting the truth that Jesus has also conquered sin, when it comes to accepting the idea that sin does not have to have dominion or control over me, that's just a little bit difficult for me to accept. Why? Because just about all of us acknowledge that we're sinners. We know that sin is, is a real problem. Now, if you're here and you've never, ever sinned, You need to talk to somebody because they'll tell you about some of your sins. But for some people, they, they really want to stop sinning. I know a lot of people, they want to they stop doing bad things. And, and, and yet it seems like for them, the harder they try to, to do good, the more bad things they end up doing. Anybody? Well, don't raise your hand on that one. But. And I'm here to tell you today that because of Jesus resurrection. I'm here to tell you today that because of Easter, it is possible to live a life that is not dominated by sin. Now that was an okay response, but this is Easter Sunday. So I'm going to say that again and give you a second chance. All right. It is possible to live a life that is not dominated by sin. Amen. It's possible to live a life that's pleasing to God. Think of that. Listen carefully as I read. It's a, it's a rather lengthy portion of scripture to read, especially on Easter Sunday, but please take note of the fact that we are no longer under the dominion of sin. In other words, we no longer have to sin because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Let me read first from Romans chapter five, verse 17. Here's what Paul writes. For the sin of this one man, Adam, remember we just talked about him a minute ago. He caused death to rule over many, but even greater... Even greater is God's wonderful grace. Isn't his grace wonderful? Isn't his grace wonderful? But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his, watch this, his gift of righteousness. You say, what is that gift of righteousness, Pastor Tim? The gift of righteousness is a gift that enables you to live a righteous life. His gift of righteousness is made available for who? For all, for all who receive it, watch this, will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Jump down to chapter six, verse six with me. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. See, when we put faith in what Christ did on the cross for us, we get his power over sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Verse seven, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. 
And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Verse 9, we are sure of this because of why? We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive, alive to God through Christ Jesus. Let me finish it up. Verse 12. Do not, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. There's the invitation today. There's the call to salvation today. There's the call to changing your life forever. Give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Look at verse 14. Sin is no longer your master. No longer. Thank God for the resurrection. Here's the, Reader's Digest, here's the Reader's Digest version of what I just said, just read to you. The Bible teaches us that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we don't have to sin anymore. We have a choice now and we can choose not to sin. See, before Christ is in your life, you really don't have a choice. You try to do good, but you, you can't apart from the power of Christ. But when you have Christ in your life, you can choose not to sin. Some of you visiting us today for the first time, perhaps you see people worshiping with a, a joy and a peace and a, an enthusiasm that maybe you're not accustomed to. It's because those people are no longer living in bondage to sin. They're no longer dragged down into the filth and depravity of the human condition. Oh, they're not perfect, not by a long shot. None of us are. None of us have arrived. We won't be perfect till we get to heaven. But, but it, it's about the direction. It's not about perfection. It's about direction. And the direction we're moving now is in sync with Jesus Christ. Our joy and gratitude, our peace and confidence grow stronger with each and every day that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ enables us to overcome and conquer that sin that would try to have dominion in our lives. And even when we do sin, God helps us not to. But even when we do, we no longer have to live under the weight of that great stone of condemnation because we have a great high priest, his name is Jesus, and he makes intercession for us. And if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our sins, all our unrighteousness. Loved ones, the Easter story has changed everything. The Easter story has changed everything. Now, because of Jesus Christ and his victory over death, over the devil, and yes, over the power or the dominion of sin, we no longer need to live a life of disobedience. Now we can choose to follow Christ. And every time we choose to follow him, he gives us resurrection power to do the right thing. I'll never forget so many years ago, and I checked my records to see when I last told this story, because my staff tells me, Pastor Tim, I've heard that story before. And I say, well, but the new staff members haven't heard it. You know, and uh, by my, according to my records, I haven't told this story in 10 years. I'm guessing there's a few of you who were not here 10 years ago. So you're going to hear the story. But this actually happened over 20 years ago. It was, in fact, 25 years ago, probably. It was very shortly after Jackie and I had come to serve as your pastor and you know, I had to find a place to get my hair cut. I don't have to do that much anymore. But anyway, uh, um, and um, found a place to get my hair cut. And uh, one time when I was there to get my hair cut, I'm waiting. I ask where the restroom is. He sends me to, tells me, the, gives me directions to the restroom. I go to the restroom and uh, step in and shut the door behind me. And, uh, and immediately sense a presence. Thank you for being so quick. I didn't even ask you to come up. Well, you are just right on cue. <laughs> immediately sensed a presence, and it wasn't a good presence. I looked in there in the back of the toilet, uh, uh, not the seat, but the back part of it. <laughs> softly, 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 softly. A stack of pornographic magazines. 
And now I understood, now I understood the presence. And I won't, I don't know if, you know, I could say I heard a voice, I didn't hear an audible voice, but a thought came to my mind and it was the voice of the enemy speaking. And he said two things to me. Talking right now about the power of the resurrection to choose not to sin. And the enemy said two things to me. Number one, go ahead and take a look. No one will know. Second, second comment or second thought came to my mind is he said, and besides, you know you want to. Now, the first thought was pretty easily dismissed. No one will know. Well, of course, one person will know. God. He sees and knows everything. Yes. He knows everything. He saw everything you did this week. Hello? He saw everything you did last night. Hello? Chance to come and pray and repent here in just a minute. He sees everything. Nothing he doesn't see. It was the second thought that was, took me another second or two. Not long, but a second or two to process. You know you really want to. And I don't know how long it had been since I'd looked at something like that. It had been a long time. And there's a part of me, well, if I'm 100% honest, how many of you are 100% honest all the time? God forgive those who just raised their hands uh, <laughs> for not being 100% honest. But if I was 100% honest, it was like, well, you know, there's, maybe there's a little tiny, tiny, tiny part of me that I guess maybe the devil's right. Maybe there's a part of me that would, would like to look. And no sooner had that thought sort of gone through my brain, is all of a sudden I heard another voice. And, the, and the, the other voice said, that's the old man talking to you. The new man is not interested in looking at those magazines. The new man who's been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, the new man who's living in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is not interested. Move on. And of course... I did. Now listen, none of us bat a thousand. Nobody bats a thousand. Nobody gets it right every time. But I, I wonder today if there's anyone here, you're just simply sick and tired of sinning. Don't you see, you, you don't have to sin anymore. You don't have to curse anymore. You don't have to cheat on your taxes anymore. You don't have to cheat on your spouse anymore. You don't have to rely on that drug habit anymore. You don't have to lie anymore. You don't have to be mean and ugly to people anymore. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ has now given you a choice, but you must make the right choice. Like one man said recently, he was so frustrated with his life of sin that he considered ending it all. Here's what he said. He said, it's not that I wanted to die. I just didn't know how to live. What a powerful statement. That's the difference that Jesus makes. That's the difference that Jesus makes. The resurrection of Jesus gives you the power to close the gap between the life you're living and the life you could be living. You see, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's Easter. That's Easter. It's death working backwards. We sang about it today. The resurrected Christ is resurrecting me. Glory to God. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor Tim, but doesn't it get hard sometimes? Well, of course it does. That's why we have reminders from Scripture that even the great apostle Paul had his tough moments. But listen to what he says. 2 Corinthians 1.8, he says, We think you ought to know, brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed, look at this, beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. Verse nine, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. Hello. Here's a cue for somebody. We stopped relying on ourselves 
and learn to rely only on God. In other words, we stopped worrying. Learn to rely only on God. What, look at the last phrase, who raises the dead. We're relying on the one who raises the dead. The story of Easter is that we can stop relying on ourselves. The story of Easter is that we can rely on God, the one who raises the dead. And if he can raise the dead, he can do anything. So we do not need to worry about death or the devil or the dominion of sin and loved ones. We don't need to worry about our destiny. Our destiny is secured in a relationship with Jesus Christ. As Jesus said to Martha right before he raised her brother Lazarus back from the dead, Jesus said in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Look at verse 26. And whoever lives by believing in me, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then Jesus asked a question. He says, do you believe this? That's the singularly most important question you will ever be asked in your life. Jesus says, do you believe me? Do you believe me that I loved you so much that I left the glories and riches of heaven to come, God in the flesh, live a perfect sinless life for you so that there on the cross of Calvary, I could take the price for your punishment on my back so that you wouldn't have to take it on yours. I was buried and I rose again from the grave to prove that everything I said was true and to prove to you that I have power over death, power over the devil, power over the dominion of sin. I've got a destiny for you. If you, if you will live in me today, you will live with me forever. Hallelujah. So there's four possible responses to the message today. It's in your outline at the bottom of your outline, but we'll put it on the screen as well. The first response would be, hey, I'm already in a real relationship with Jesus. Doesn't mean you're perfect or sinless or anything like that, but you're already in a real relationship with Jesus. You love Jesus with all your heart, endeavoring to follow him and serve him. If that's you, you can circle A. Or maybe you're B today. I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus today. You've come on Easter Sunday. Even in coming today, you were already something in your heart and soul was saying, I'm going to church because I, I know I need God. And today, you're ready to say, Jesus, I'm ready to begin a real relationship with you. If that's you, we're going to say a prayer together in just a second. C would be those who would say, I'd like to consider it a bit more before making a decision. That's okay. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're thinking about it. We're glad you're considering what it involves. We're not here to kind of bend your arm into some kind of emotional response. This is the biggest, most important decision of your life and of your eternity. So you go ahead and consider it and we'll be praying for you. Finally, there are some who might say, well, I don't ever intend on making that decision. Can I tell you how thrilled we are that you're here today too? And can I tell you that we love you? And we're praying for you. We're praying for you. Because many people who would have circled D last Easter are circling A this Easter. They didn't think it ever happened. So at the end of your outline, I'd ask you to look at that right now with me because we're going to say this prayer together. I'm going to encourage everyone to Pray it out loud with me, unless you just don't feel like you could pray this prayer. In that case, you need not participate. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, Pastor Tim, I'm already a Christian. Can I tell you something? It never hurt a single Christian to say the sinner's prayer again. In fact, some of you need to say it again. <laughs> Let's pray together and just humble our hearts before the Lord. Would you pray with me, everyone together that can pray this out loud with me? Dear Jesus, I come to you today giving you my whole heart and life. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and need your forgiveness. I believe that you are the Son of God 
and that you died for my sins on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead, proving that you are the almighty and miracle working God. I put all my hopes, my trust, and my faith in you today, knowing that you have a perfect plan for my life. And whatever challenges there may be in my way, I do not need to worry because nothing is too difficult for you. You are the God who raises the dead. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of closing prayer? First time visitors, I look forward to meeting you in the Welcome Center in just a few moments. I want to say a special prayer for those who perhaps just prayed that sinner's prayer for the first time ever. Or maybe you'd prayed it a long time ago, but you know you wandered away from a relationship with Jesus. And today you prayed that prayer and in saying that prayer, you're saying, Jesus, today I'm back. I'm yours. I'm your man. I'm your woman. I'm surrendered to you. I'm giving myself completely to God today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, just affording everyone this moment of privacy, I will not call you out. I'll not embarrass you. That's not what this is about. This is about giving me a chance to pray for you and for you to just take one tiny step further down the road in acknowledging Christ. And here's my request. If today you prayed that sinner's prayer and today you surrendered your heart to Jesus, would you just slip your hand up and put it down real quick that I might pray with you and for you. God bless you. God bless you. Let me look, let me look across the ground floor first from my right to your left. Anyone slip your hand up and put it down. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to my left now. Slip your hand up and put it down. God bless you. I see all those hands in the back. Thank you. Coming right down to the front. Thank you. Now, how about the balcony? Anybody in the balcony today? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the way over to the right. God bless you, 15, 20 hands at least. God bless you, God bless you. Now let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for the dozens of hands that were just raised. Men, women, teenagers, young people who today said yes to Jesus. Who today said, Jesus, I don't, I'm tired of sinning and I'm tired of worrying. And Lord, today I put my trust completely in you. I give myself completely and totally to you. Take my life, Lord Jesus. Make of it what you will. Lord, seal upon their hearts the magnitude of the decision they make this day. And may today be a new beginning, not just a once a year event, but a new beginning of a forever relationship with Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Now listen, here's how we close every Sunday. We close singing a chorus. And you see these people down front, they're here to pray for anybody and everybody, whatever your need might be. If you just got something you'd like somebody to pray with you about, they're here to pray with you. But especially to those of you who raised your hands, if you would, come and they have some literature. Tell them you received Jesus today. They have some literature they'd like to give you and help you begin your relationship with the Lord. And we want you to know we're here to help you as well. Would you stand with me? Let's worship together. First time visitors, I'll see you in a few minutes in the Welcome Center.